Well, hi, everybody. This is Heidi St. John. I'm glad you guys joined me at my little corner of the internet. This is the Off the Bench podcast. Today is Mailbox Monday. This is the day when I answer your questions. We've got some really interesting ones today, including should women be senior pastors? Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, I'm glad you guys have joined me today. The St. John's have had a pretty busy weekend. Our daughter, Sierra, got married to a wonderful young man. His name is Jake. They got married yesterday. And so we've just been uh, kind of reveling in the the new addition to our family. And they're off on their honeymoon now. So uh, I want to say thanks for all of you who have just extended your congratulations. I did post a few pictures of the wedding on my social media. And it was just, uh, it's just a beautiful thing to watch your children grow up and find their life partner. So we're excited about that. Uh, I told you guys last week, I believe, that my stepdad was ailing uh, and he did indeed pass away. His service is coming up this week. We appreciate your continued prayers. You know, I was thinking about it this morning and just the fact that we come into different seasons of life and we never know really what's around the corner or uh, we're not guaranteed. My husband said to me, and listen, we serve at the pleasure of the Lord and we live and move, the Bible says, and have our being at the pleasure of the Lord. And so it's been a reminder to me as I've watched my daughter enter into a brand new season of her life. And of course, our family, you know, likewise, we come into a different season with her because whenever our kids get married, the family dynamic changes and we're in a different season and and time is is moving on. It really, really is. And I hope that as you are listening to this show and nurturing your own families and paying attention to what God's asked you to do, that you remember that the Bible says that our lives are like grass and the grass will wither and the flower will fade. But the Bible says the word of God stands forever. And I don't know about you, um, but I want my life to count not just for this life, but for the life to come. And we live with that hope as believers. And so um, I just appreciate so many of you who've reached out to us on social media and offered uh, kind of an odd season of sort of condolences and congratulations uh, pretty much simultaneously. So I want to thank you for that. We've got a lot of questions coming into the podcast. If you would like to have your question addressed on the air, you can visit HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday. That is the place to leave your question. I always tell people, listen, leave your question, but have it be short and sweet and to the point. The more succinct those questions are, the greater likelihood that they will be answered on the air. It helps the staff to go through them and sort of categorize them. So I want to thank you guys for doing that. Also want to let you know that coming right up is my brand new study on identity. We're going to be studying what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a daughter of the king, what it means to be a mother. The culture right now, even inside the church, is really struggling with the issue of identity. Where did I come from? Where am I going? What does does sex matter to God? Does gender important to the Lord? And the Bible addresses these issues. And you guys have heard me say this over and over again, so I'm not gonna belabor the point today, but the Bible has a lot to say about sex and gender. And in fact, the next one of the next studies that I'm gonna be publishing is gonna be talking specifically about sex. I can't wait to do it. A long time ago, I taught on this issue. Somehow I became the Dr. Ruth of homeschooling because I wrote a book called The Busy Homeschool Mom's Guide to Romance. And I wrote this at a, at a season of my life. I think that book came out in 2007. I wrote it in a season of my life that we were going through a lot as a family. Many of you know that I came from a broken home and that legacy has been passed on in, in our family really for generations. My grandfather on my dad's side uh, left my grandmother, and we watch the the family legacy of whatever it is, whether it's um, a, a generational sin or it's a or it's a decision to not uh, not be faithful in marriage. Those generational sins have impact on children for generations to come. And God says that if we will lean into His Word and understand His Word, that is the path that leads to uh, a fruitful life. That's the path that leads to blessing. And God's blessings are not found outside his boundaries. And so for the next couple of months here, we're going to just take on some hot topics that are in the culture and address them from a biblical point of view. And I can't wait for you guys to join me. You can sign up 
at momstronginternational.com. Now is the best time to do that. We're kicking off the fall study series, and I can't wait to have you join me there. All right, I want to jump right into your questions today. Jen in California is wondering if it's okay to buy curriculum ahead of time. I thought this was a pretty cute question. She said, Heidi, my baby boy is one, and I will retire from the military in about three years. We will be on essentially one income, and I'll be homeschooling. Can I buy the curriculum before I get out of the military and let it sit there for a couple of years until he's of age? Well, Jen, I, absolutely, you can do that. I I think that I would argue against it because I'll tell you what, you're going to be a different person in three years. You might have a different idea of a style that you want to teach in, or you may have found a new curriculum. You know, curriculums come and go in terms of sort of what's popular and what's not. I was just talking to my daughter who is homeschooling. Uh, two of her four children right now. And she has really been enjoying a curriculum that I didn't even know about three years ago. And so I guess I would say I wouldn't jump too far ahead, especially since your little one is just one year old. I think just enjoy them, get out the get out the uh, cookie sheets and dump rice into it and teach them as letters and that kind of thing. But I wouldn't worry too much about buying curriculum ahead of time, mostly for the reasons that I just outlined. Things are going to change. You're going to change. Your son is going to change. And there may be a different curriculum offering in three years that isn't there right now. So I think just enjoy your kids. Sometimes we we really, I think, can overthink what it means to uh, get ready for homeschooling. And when you overthink it, you know, sometimes we we wind up in a position where we have more than we need or we changed our mind. This certainly happened to me when I was a brand new homeschool mom. And I've told this story many times here at the show, so I'm not going to go you know, through the whole thing again today. But I'll tell you, I bought a curriculum that was relatively expensive and I believed everything that that curriculum said on the cover. You know, this is going to help your kids be, you know, more successful in school. This is going to help your child do really great, you know, getting into college or whatever it was. I mean, the promises were just, you know, uh, over the top really. <laughs> but, but you know what? It worked for me. I was like, that's what I want. Checked all the boxes. Check, 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 check. Well, I got it home. And my older daughter, Savannah, liked it. My second daughter, eh, not no, not so much. The other thing that was so awesome about this curriculum or something I loved, and I'm not going to name the curriculum. Some of you are asking, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not here to slam anybody's curriculum because what works for you might not work for me and, and vice versa. But anyway, by the time I got to my third child, my son, uh, he was not impressed. He didn't like it at all. And so here I've got, I'm trying to make this curriculum work for multiple ages I've got one daughter who's like, eh, you know, it's it's okay. It's working for me. One daughter who doesn't love it, but she could tolerate it. And then my son who was just, you know, it was making him cry. And so eventually, and I was bummed because I had spent, you know, $600 on this boxed curriculum. I sent it all back and it took us a couple of months to sort of recalibrate. And I realized that was when sort of in me, at least as a homeschool mom, I really came to embrace the idea that I want to fold my children where they're bent. That takes time. And your your child, like I said a moment ago, you're going to be very different in a different place three years from now. And actually, you might even buy something and it works for you one year and doesn't work the next. And so that's one of the beautiful things about homeschooling. We can go with the ebb and the flow of where we're at and then change when we need to, right? So we're not locked into a, a classroom or a, 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 a style that we determine at the beginning of the year, boy, howdy, this is what we're going to do come hell or high water, right? If things change, we need to be able to change with them. So I'm excited for you as you get ready to embark on that journey of homeschooling your children. As I've told you guys many times, homeschooling our children was the single hardest but best decision that we ever made in terms of parenting our children. Uh, the educational choices that we make for them really does determine a lot about family dynamics and where the family goes. And so be listening to your kids and watch and see because what works for one child might not work for another one. And so I think it's a good idea just to be uh, as chill as long as you can be. Anonymous in Michigan wrote in and said, Heidi, I have a soft hearted boy who has always been sweet to everyone. However, his attitude is more quiet lately, and he's sullen. He gives grumpy short answers whenever he's asked anything, all since turning 15 and 16. I know he loves church, and I know he loves the Lord, but how do I even talk to him? It's no fun when he seemed annoyed with everything I try. Well, you know what you just did? You just described a teenager to me. I just heard, uh, I just heard a mom describing a teenager. 
listen, hang in there. I'm really glad. I don't know about you guys, but I'm I'm very, very happy that I do not have to go back and live my my teenage life over again. Because being a teenager was hard enough when I was a kid. And you know what? Guess what? I actually think it's harder now than it was years ago. But I think that there's some gentle ways that we can deal with moody teenagers. I think the first thing you got to remember is don't take it personally. All right. There's a lot going on inside the body and the mind of a 15, 16 year old boy. And the the best parents that I have watched handle their children through these seasons over the years are the ones that sort of laugh at themselves, right? So instead of taking it personally on the mood swinging days, instead of being angry with your kid, and I'm not pretending that I've gotten this all right, because I will reach a point where I'm just like, would you for the love, just snap out of it, right? But trust me, I don't think that the goal of your teenager is to make you miserable. Uh, They're caught in a chasm between adulthood and childhood, and it really is a time of transition. And I told my daughter something that my friend Steve Lambert said to me years ago when we were starting the real transition from young adult, uh, from teenager to young adult. And it's a it's a transition phase and it's hard on the parents and it's hard on the kids. And Steve said to me, listen, Heidi, nobody ever transitions gracefully, right? So here you've got your child, your young or your older teenager transitioning to being a young adult. It's like trying to walk a tight wire between where you were and where you're going to go. And it's wobbly and it's hard and it's scary. And I think we need to acknowledge that with our kids. It's a lot to handle, especially for teens. So give them space and room to have a bad day. Uh, it's probably really important to make sure that your kids are getting enough sleep. Talk to them, you know, uh, taking a look at their diet, you know, finding out where where your kids are at emotionally and spiritually, making time to have those conversations. But be really careful not to take it personally because your teen is reacting to what's happening inside of them, but also around them. And so we want to be as grace-filled as we can with our teenagers. And uh, and as a mother of, of teens, you know, someone said to me that I would hate the teenage years, that I would just be, you know, ruining the day that I ever became a mother once our kids became teenagers. That was not my experience. Did we have bad days? Yes, but I have bad days as an adult, right? We have bad days in our marriages. I did not think that raising teens was any more challenging than raising young, uh, you know, young children. And the the fact of the matter is that whether your children are, you know, two or five or seven or nine, or whether they're 15, 16, 17, 18, the principles of God's word remain the same, but the application is different. And I do think that as your children get older, particularly if they start, you know, if they start, you know, talking back and giving you grief and all kinds of things, that is very difficult to handle. But we, and we don't want to be grumpy. Right. I mean, remember, I'm always telling you guys, you can't you can't pass on what you don't possess. And grumpiness is I think some of our kids are more prone to it than others. Some people are just born with a sunny disposition. They always tend to see the the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. My sister-in-law, Loy, is a lot like that. You know, she's very much the the bloom where you're planted personality. But some of us are grumpy. And we've all maybe always been grumpy or or some people believe maybe the grumpiness is kind of a part of who they are. But listen, uh, I want you just to remember something. And I'm going to link back to, I I saw some really great verses on this. Uh, And then one author, and see if I can find find his name. Oh, I can't. I'll just link back to it in the show notes because I don't see a name on here. But he said that grumpiness, continual grumpiness is sin. Not like, you know, you've had a bad day, you know, the occasional grumpy, but just like this person is just grumpy, 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 grumpy. Consider a negative personality. Listen to what he said. Consider negative personality traits to be like barnacles on the hull of a boat. I thought this was good. Barnacles are the bane of boat owners because the little crustaceans cluster by the thousands, increasing drag and decreasing a boat's fuel efficiency. Barnacles are notoriously difficult to remove. Sins of the personality such as grumpiness are like that. They attach themselves to your lives, they weigh us down, and they keep us from experiencing all that it means to walk by the Spirit, according to Galatians 5. So the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 5, 16, so I say, then walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The grumpy Christian needs to resist shrugging off the problem by saying things like, well, this is just how I am. I'm, it's too difficult for me to change. Listen, Jesus paid too high a price to free us from our old ways 
for us to remain enslaved. And I love uh, Romans chapter six, uh, verses one to four. This is a beautiful passage. What then shall I say? Shall we go on sinning that grace might increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And that is the truth when it comes to your your children having attitude problems. So if you notice that you've got a child who's sullen all the time, grumpy all the time, address it. Because a grumpy kid is going to turn into a grumpy adult and ain't nobody got time for that, right? I'm always telling my kids, nobody likes that. You get out of relationships what you put into them. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I'll continue answering your questions. All right. Welcome back. I've got a couple of questions here. Actually, I get this question all the time and I have answered it before. One of my favorite sites to go to for some of these questions that come in, as you guys have heard me mention before, is a, is a website called gotquestions.org. This one came from an anonymous listener in Kentucky. She said, Heidi, I recently saw on Facebook someone I grew up with at the church, their wife was just ordained as a reverend the head senior pastor of a local Baptist church. That actually surprises me. I'd be interested to find what kind of, what Baptist Church is doing that. It was posted from a Facebook group called Baptist Women in Mission in Ministry and promotes women becoming senior pastors in their churches. This seems sad to me because God and his word are very clear about this. What's even more sad are people who are Christians that I know personally commenting and saying, congratulations. We don't go to this church, but how do you deal with those you thought were true believers celebrating something that is clearly against God's plan? Lindsay in Port Orange, Florida, had a similar question and she wrote in and said, how do you feel about women pastors? All right. So this, this is the truth. I don't think there's many other more hotly debated issues in the church today than the issue of women serving as pastors. It's very important for us not to see this as men versus women. There are women who believe that women should not serve as pastors and that the Bible places restrictions on the ministry of women. And there are also men who believe that women can serve as pastors and there are no restrictions on women in ministry. So I, I don't want you guys to see this as an issue of chauvinism. This is a, an issue of biblical interpretation. And I'm quoting from gotquestions.org. The word of God proclaims, quote, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. In the church, God assigns different roles to men and women. This is a result of the way mankind was created and the way in which sin entered the world. First uh, Timothy chapter two, verses 13 and 14 records a story and, and repeats it again. God, through the apostle Paul, is restricting women from serving in roles of teaching or having spiritual authority over men in the church. This precludes women from serving as pastors over men, which definitely includes uh, a lot of the roles that you see some of these churches taking right now and just kind of ignoring this and glossing over it. And there are a lot of objections, of course, to this view of women in pastoral ministry. One common one is that Paul restricts women from teaching because it's the first century and uh, women were typically uneducated. However, First Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, do not mention educational status of women as a reason why God instituted this hierarchy. I want to I want to point out too because I have seen this abused as a woman who speaks out on the speaker circuit. I will I will confess uh you know being out especially 15 years ago when I started speaking it was a very a very tough gig for a woman to speak in the homeschool community because people had taken this teaching that Paul gives this very clear instruction that women are not to be pastors, certainly not senior pastors in churches. And they just said, well, women can't speak anywhere that men are. In fact, there was one homeschool conference in particular that I would go to year after year. And the rooms that I was speaking in were sold out. You know, people were sitting on the floor and they were having to give out free CDs to people who couldn't get in the room. And one of the conference organizers came to me at the end of that conference one year. And she said, hey, Heidi, what would you, we, you know, we're looking for a keynote speaker for next year. Do you know anyone? And I said, pick me. I would love to do it. I said, I would love to speak as a keynote speaker. I know I could do it. And she's like, oh yeah, we don't, uh, we don't allow women to teach men. And well, a couple things came to mind. A, I was like, this isn't church. And B, you're letting me do it in the small room, but you won't let me do it in the big room, which makes you a hypocrite. And you're not addressing the true issue that that Paul is instructing uh, the church through uh, through Timothy, right? 
And so we miss God's heart when we say, you know, women can't teach uh, men at all, right? Particularly in context of conferences and places like that. I've had actually people come up to Jay and scold him at some of the conferences that we have been attending over the years. It doesn't happen as much now as it used to, but it's a wrong understanding. And you can understand, and this is a topic for another day because I'm going to go way over time today, but you can understand how women have been hurt and been the victims of a wrong understanding of scripture, a wrong application of scripture uh, and hurting women unnecessarily because they've gone beyond the church and they've taken it to other aspects of ministry. And women are uh, gifted. The Bible has given us all gifts and we are we are to be given the room to use them. Many gifts uh, the, the, of the women that I know, these women have gifts of hospitality, they have gifts of teaching, they have gifts of uh, serving, of evangelism, and much of the ministry in local churches actually depends on women. And in the Bible, women are not restricted from praying in public, from prophesying, only from having spiritual teaching authority over men inside the church, in a church setting. This is God's design. This was God's instruction. And we may not understand it. And I know some of you women are offended. And honestly, uh, it doesn't matter. This is, it doesn't matter if we're offended or not. We need to look and see what the Bible says. There are a lot of things in God's word that we kind of scratch our heads and go, why did he say that? But he did say it. God gave men spiritual headship in the home. God has created a, a hierarchy in the home, a hierarchy in the church, and the Bible nowhere restricts women from exercising the gifts of the spirit that we find in 1 Corinthians 12. Women, just as much as men, are called to minister to others, to demonstrate the fruit of the spirit, to proclaim the gospel to the lost. You guys, go read Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 to 20, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, th- verse 15. God has ordained that only men are to serve in positions of spiritual teaching and authority in the church. And this is not because men are necessarily better teachers or because women are inferior or less intelligent. This isn't the case. It's simply the way God designed the church to function. Men are to set the example in spiritual leadership in their lives and through their words. And in this regard, women are to take a less authoritative role. Women are encouraged to teach other women. In Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, the Bible also does not restrict women from teaching children. And, you know, someone said to me the other day that, you know, women, you know, God's instruction uh, was so that women don't teach in the church because women are more easily deceived than men. Well, if that's the case, then why does the Bible not preclude them from teaching children who are clearly more easily deceived, right? Right. We know that children are more easily deceived than adults simply by virtue of the fact that they're not mature. So I don't think that's a good, solid biblical case. I think it doesn't make any sense, actually. But I want to encourage you, uh, God's plan and His the way that he has set up the structure of the church and the structure of the home come from the heart of a creator who knows what's best for his creation. And this is the heart of God, and I think we need to honor it. And so when when people write into me and say, you know, I mean, I think this is the fourth or fifth time I've answered this question. I appreciate that the question continues to come in. I believe we need to be like the Bereans. And the Bible records that the Bereans studied the word of God. They wanted to understand the heart of God. What What is his word saying? Why is he giving this instruction? And then we want to, as best we can, live according to the plan that God lays out in scripture. And I believe that that precludes women from being senior pastors in churches. So that's all that I've got time for today. If you guys have questions that you'd like me to address here at the show, go to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash Mailbox Monday. I want to thank you guys so much for visiting the sponsors at the Heidi St. John podcast. It really does help us keep this show on the air. We really appreciate it. I'm going to come back in a couple of days and talk to you a little bit about how to get a podcast set up. Some of my sort of, I guess, tips and tricks. If you are interested in getting your voice out there, uh, I, I want to just help you along the way. I hope you guys are having a great afternoon. Love your families well today. And I will see you back tomorrow at the intersection of faith and culture.